All right. So this is lecture 16 of ECE 503. Okay. So in this lecture, it really consists of two parts, which we're going to discuss in some detail in each part. The first one is essentially we're going to talk about an efficient way, two efficient ways, of trying to handle long sequences of information. Suppose we have a filter, and we need some sort of way of handling long sequences, but without breaking the bank in terms of computational efficiency. Right? So we saw the DFT last class, and we noticed that if we want some sort of, like we, we can perform some sort of operation using several DFTs in order to get an answer without having to use convolution, right? However, we realize that if we use a very large DFT, we're consuming quite a bit of computational resources on the part of our platform, and is it really necessary? Is there a way that, in fact, we can divide and conquer, oh, I love that word, or phrase, divide and conquer our sequence in order to perform the same operation and save on computational cycles? And the answer is absolutely yes. So let's, let's take a little, I'm, just like the last few lectures, I'm going like, to take, um, take the excitement out. I'm just going like, to jump into it. Blank screen. All righty then. So this is what I'm talking about. So suppose I have a very long sequence. OK? So let's say I have this guy, x of n. Very, 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 very long, right? And I want to filter him, let's say, with this guy, h of n. Let's say h of n is m long, right? And this guy here is huge. I don't even know how long he is, right? And so we saw how to filter using DFTs before. So filtering. So this is one of the properties of the DFT we saw last class. Filtering with DFTs is you get y of k by multiplying h of k. That's the uh, DFT of h of n times x of k. So this guy here is the DFT of y of n. This guy here is the DFT of h of n. And this guy here is the DFT of x of n. Right? So this is how you do filtering. Now, this, imagine you have to filter this guy here. <gasps> so how, how do you filter, how do you filter h of k and, and x of k when h, x of k is going to be ginormous, right? So let's say this guy, x of n, is tens of thousands of samples. And little old h of n is only m samples. It's like tiny. <coughs> As you can see, I don't do very high-pitched voices very well. <coughs> Anyways, <laughs> sorry. So what happens is, how in a, in a normal setting, how would you filter x of n and h of n, especially if they're different sizes? Use zero pad. So in any situation, because h of k and x of k got to match dimension uh, their d dimensions, right? So in general, so let's say we have in general here. Okay, what happens? So let's say I have x of n and I have h of n. And no, I'm not going to use high-pitched voices. What I would do is, first of all, I am going to zero pad, zp. And then I take, let's say now these two guys are n long. And so then I do dft of length n, dft of length n. Now I have x of k, I have h of k. I multiply the two together to get y of k. And then I take the inver inverse discrete Fourier transform, that's n point, to get y of n. Simple. That's how we do filtering using DFTs. So you see the problem here, right? If I were to do this now with the scenario on top here, 
I'm going to have something tens of thousands of samples long. Then I have this filter that might be just 20, 30, 100 samples long, points long. I would have to add tens of thousands of zeros, take the DFT of each, multiply the two together, take the inverse DFT. It's going to be bad, right? We're t like, you know, doing that sort of computation is not going to be efficient. So what do you do? And you might say, oh, that never is going to happen. Yes, it will, folks. Imagine if you're collecting, let's say, light levels, right? So you have a sensor, and it's accumulating data, and it's storing it in memory, blah, 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 blah. And then I want to find out what the frequency response of the environment is. And I have tens of thousands of light measurements, right? So here's the thing. What can we do? And that, that is where these two techniques I'm talking about come in. There are two. The first one the first one is called overlap and save. So what we do, and, and this is a nice little trick, is suppose I don't want to use a DFT of tens of thousands of points wide. Suppose I want to use a DFT of 256, but my data stream might be that big. What I can do is First of all, so let's say my filter is m long. What I can do is the following. First of all, let's say I want to process this entire input stream. And I break it up into segments that are l long. L, l, l. And maybe there are more. Then what I do is I zero pad with m minus 1 zeros at the beginning of the first sequence here. And so now what I do is I say, OK, I have x1 of n. That's why I call this segment. So that's L plus the m minus 1 zeros. I take the DFT of that. So what we have, I'm taking the L plus m minus 1 point DFT of x1 of n. I take the L plus m minus 1 DFT of h of n, multiply the two together, I produce one part of the output, take the inverse DFT of that size, repeat. Do it for every segment. Now, here's the interesting thing. I take the last m minus 1 points of x1 of n and bring it forward to the next guy. I, I append them at the beginning of the next L points and do that, the same thing. Let, let, let's draw it. Let's draw it. And hopefully I won't mess up. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's do it. Because I think somehow drawing in real time just feels so much more like intuitive. All right. Long sequence, right? And let's say we have in the corner here. We have h of n, and this guy here is m long, right? So what I want to do is I tack on l minus 1 zeros. I'm zero padding, such that now the total length of this sucker is m plus l minus 1. I take the DFT of this guy. And, and the DFT is going to be m plus l minus 1 points. And now I have h of k. OK? So far, so good? Now what I do is I break this up into l points, l points, l points, and so on. OK? First thing I do is I tack on m minus 1 zeros. So what I do is I take this guy and I take the DFT, right? So I call this guy here, this guy here, I call him x1 of n. I take the DFT, l plus m minus 1, and I produce 
x1 of k. And so what I'm going to do now is I take x1 k, I take h of k, they're both the same size, multiply them together, and I produce y1 of k. Then, what I do is I take m minus 1 points at the end of the last guy, and I take the L points after him. I take the DFT of that guy, L plus M minus 1 point DFT, and I produce X2 of K. I'm referring to this guy here as X2 of N. So the big thing that I need to point out here is that these X's, X1's, X2's, X3's, X4's, they're all overlapping with each other, right? What I'm looking for is essentially each sequence is L plus M minus 1 long, and then I take the DFT of it. The first one I have to compensate for that first missing M minus 1, so I have zero pad it. Zero padding is cool because it doesn't cost me anything except size, dimensionality, and I usually use that in order to make sure that everything is consistently the same size. I do the same thing here. M minus 1 of the last guy and L of the next guy, I do the DFT, L plus M minus 1, and I get X3 of K. And he is, in the time domain, X3 of N. So now, what I get is Y1 of K. If I do the same thing, X2 of K, and I have H of K, and I multiply them together, I get Y2 of K. If I take X3 of K and H of K and multiply them together, I get Y3 of K. And I, I do that con consecutively. So what I'm doing is I take a segment, take its FFT, multiply it with the HK, right? That gives me essentially the filtered output of those two sequences. And then you know what's next. I take the inverse discrete Fourier transform of each one. So I get Y1 of N, Y2 of N, Y3 of N, do, 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 do. And there's a reason for that. It turns out if I set this up this way, why do we call it overlap safe? Here's the reason. I'm going to keep this because I think some people are still writing it. The reason why we call it overlap is save is because notice now what I do is I take each one of these y1 of n's, okay? So I discard the beginning part of y1 of n, the first m, m minus 1. I discard this part here, the m minus 1 of y2 of m. So I basically throw away the beginning part, the m minus 1 points of every y n, a y i of n, and then I stitch them together. It turns out if you do it this way, you get exactly the same result as if you filter. If you take h of n and convolve it with that entire sequence, it's really cool. Try it out. You will, yes? It's, it's filler, because what we want to do is we want to have the consistency. So the question is, the m minus 1 zeros at the beginning, like those are extra. And the answer is absolutely yes, because what we want is I only want to create h of k once. And h of k has to be the same size for every segment, right? So the first guy, l is not the same as l plus m minus 1. So we, do, we don't... We, do, like by adding zeros, we don't affect the data, and we make it actually the same size. So if we add m minus 1 zeros to the beginning, what we do is we get a DFT that now matches size-wise, and then after we're done with that, we chop it off. 
right? That's a great question. And we do that with every one of them, right? So then we take the next guy and discard the m minus 1 points from the front. And, that, and, and then what we do is we then add them together. You might say, well, how come? Well, because by the, the operation that we're performing, that the information is shared in both the same places, right? Like this guy here and that guy, what happens is you can only have one, at least in this formulation. So we need to discard them, and then we just stitch the remaining parts we don't throw away together to get the corresponding composite filtered signal, right? So this is one technique, right? So you might say, OK, so we have to follow this formula. Absolutely. Right? So this is one. And in fact, for your problem set that I just assigned, you'll be implementing this with a sound file. So, so what happens is that's a perfect example. You're going to have a sound file. It's going to have tens of thousands of data, right, samples in it. And you'll be using overlap and save in order to perform the filtering on that using this technique. Because the filter might only be a few hundred coefficients, but your data might be very, very long. So this is one way of handling that. Do you have to have a zero pass? If you can set the system up to be more efficient, since the L is equal to the, the, uh, the buffer size, do you have to have a zero pass? Blah. Yes. Um, so y the question is, do you have to have a zero pad? And the answer is yes, mainly because what you want is you do want that overlapping region between every one of those segments so you have some sort of that uh, continuity. So that's sort of intuitively what comes to mind. Uh, if you don't, uh, you know, and you separate this out, what OK, maybe I do need to look into that, but intuitively, my, my gut feeling would be um, you would need to have that zero pad, at least at the beginning, unless you take the F of T of this guy L, this guy L, this guy L, uh, sorry, DFT, in order to find its frequency response. But then what happens is um, the reason why we do the M minus 1. So in two t so here, OK, so why, why do we have M minus 1? Why such a cockamamie number, right? Why is it corresponding to the length of your filter minus 1? Any ideas? Well, it, well it, part of the reason is also if you take this guy, what you're doing is what happens when you convolve two signals together? What is the resulting length of the output? It will be L plus M minus 1. So if you have sequence L and you have filter M, what you get when you convolve the two together will be L plus M minus 1. And then what happens is if you like use MATLAB and such, what, what happens when you use the filter command? It'll truncate um, part of your signal. It will basically say, well, my input will be this long. Let's say it's L. And the output that's going to be produced will also be L. So the operation here, so that, sorry, so that's a more satisfactory answer. So the reason why we choose m minus 1 zeros and m minus 1 sort of overlapping regions and the like is that it, it corresponds to if we convolve this data right away. And also like, you know, sort of the transitional region. So once we're done with the actual operation of the filtering, then you have sort of like the part that dies off when like the rest of the response that trickles through. And, and what we do in this case is we kind of have this happening at that end as well. So you kind of have the last several bits. So these guys here, when you perform the filtering operation, they, fl if, especially if it's an FIR filter, it flows into the rest of them. And then what you do is you truncate that part off and then stitch it together with the last guy. So there's that continuity, if you will. So let, let me actually draw that. Now I'm on a roll. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. Yay. Let me get rid of this. Control A. Boop. So let's let's look at this. So what happens? So what happens when you convolve, let's say L convolve with M? You get a sequence 
So it's going to be L plus M minus 1 long, right? So what ends up happening is when you convolve these two guys together, um, what you, especially if it's an FIR filter here, it's an, and, and the signal here is just, you know, just a bunch of samples coming in, what you're going to get is something ultimately uh, that will have a tail and will die off, right? So what you're going to get is something that's going to look like this, and then it will die off. In the case of the um, overlap save method, what do you have? Well, you have 0, and then you have L. And so what happens is if you do the convolution stuff, so you have the 0 pad here. So uh, if you convolve it, you convolve something with 0, it's going to be 0. And then you have the rest of the sequence and, uh, that you convolve with, right? And what you want to do is you want some sort of continuity between this L and the next L. That's why we have this segment carried forward, because if you convolve him, these samples, when you convolve, will extend out into the rest of L, right? And then if you throw him out and move him up and stitch him with this guy, it almost looks like there's some sort of continuity and nothing happened, okay? So does that make sense? So th what we're doing in this case is we're adding sort of the, la the tail of the last sequence to the beginning of the next to sort of have the sort of the like you know here are the last several samples that will influence the rest of that frame of those L samples and then when we're done with the filtering cut them off and stitch it as though oh nothing happened it looked like there's some sort of continuity the samples and M minus one is tricky because suppose you take like for instance the best way of showing this is suppose you take a delta, right, and you convolve it with something that looks like this, right? So suppose that's m minus 1, right? Or sorry, m. What happens when you convolve two together? You essentially flush out. You're going to get this guy at the end of the day, right? So you're going to have this guy here, and then the impulse response here. And so let's say more, more realistically, if you have a bunch of deltas, right, and you convolve it with this, what you're going to get, let me get rid of these guys. Ah. Anyways, let's use a racer. Ah, such a cool tool. What you're going to get is something that's going to look really messy, right? So let's say that's L long. And then you're going to get the tail that's going to be m minus 1, right? And so what we want to do is when we, let's say we have multiple segments of data, we know that the tail is going to be there. So what we want to do is essentially the next data superimposes on where the last data leaves off and leaves off and leaves off and leaves off. So we want to treat each segment of data independently, but we need to make sure that when we reintroduce all the segments back together, it makes sense. All right? OK. Cool. So the other, the other technique, and it's very similar, is overlap add. And so overlap add, again, very, very similar. But what we do in this case is we zero pad every L frames at the end. So what we're doing essentially is we're letting the entire filtering operation per L samples flush out by M minus 1, essentially the impulse response of your filter. And then what we do is we stitch them all together. So that way we have continuity in very much the same way like I described before. So if you look at this guy, What you've got is you have this guy, and uh, so you convolve him with your H filter, and he then flushes out the remaining tail M minus 1, right? And into those zero pads, and zero pad, and zero pad. And what happens is when you add them all together, it almost looks like, hey, that last sample of X, uh, X1 of N is flowing into the beginning part of X2 of N 
which is what would have happened if you just filtered everything consecutively, right? And then the same thing can be said of the last sample of x2 of n flows into x3 of n. And the last sample of x3 of n flows into x4 of n, and so on and so forth. So again, you're going to see this in your problem set. To implement this, you have, doing segment by segment by segment, it will be equivalent to doing convolution across the entire tens of thousands of data points. All right. Mm, good question. So discard the last or not? Uh, honestly, I think you could go either way. It's just like, for instance, again, going back to the MATLAB functions, you have filter and you have convolution. It's really up to, it's really up to whether you want to see the memory of the filtering flush out in the remaining m minus 1 samples, or if you don't care about it and you just say, all I really care about is what is the output of the filtering process, and that, that uh, flushing out pro I don't care. So you can truncate. So you can do it either way. It really depends on your application. Like some people might find it very important, especially if, let's say, through your filtering operation, you have some sort of delay, and the information that's delayed might be ending up. Like maybe your data, your output data is shifted from, let's say, instead of zero delay to something, then you don't want to truncate. So that, that's a great question. All right. OK. So a little bit more about that is actually in section 7.4 of your textbook. Um, the other part that I was telling you guys about was respect to discrete cosine transform. Again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. We're not going to use a lot of this in class. But you should be aware. And there's actually a lot of literature about this. What happens is, um, so we saw what the discrete Fourier uh, transform looks like, right? Um, in terms of its representation. But it's actually really interesting if your data is real and even. It turns out, so let's say we, we know what our, so we know what our um, discrete, for, uh, discrete Fourier transform looks like. So let's say we take this guy here. So x of k, naive. So you know that x of k is equal to what? n is equal to 0, n minus 1, right? x of n, and then w, n, n, k, right? And we all know that, again, w is equal to what? It's going to be equal to e to the j, um, what is it, 2 pi over n, right? Did I forget a minus sign? Let's say there's no minus sign, and if I'm wrong, we can always go back to it, right? So definition. So what happens is, this is great, but um, what are several things? First of all, um, the output here, so we know that this is going to produce a complex output, right? We have this j 2 pi n, and we know that by Euler's relation, Euler, that this guy, e to the j 2 pi of n, even if I messed up, um, you know, so let's say we have uh, n k. What happens is that's going to be equal to cosine 2 pi n k over n plus j sine 2 pi n k over n, right? Euler relationship. But it has a complex term. So what I'm kind of interested in is, is there a particular structure for x of n? that I can use, or that I observe, or that I'm manipulating that produces a kind of pleasant result, right? So what do I mean? So let's go back. So what I'm kind of interested in is, now suppose I only want real value coefficients, OK, that come out of this DFT. Suppose I want real out. What would be the structure of the data going in? And the answer is real and even. Okay? So what does that mean? So what do I need to do? What I need to do, essentially, is somehow I need to eliminate the second part of the 
discrete Fourier transform. I need to only have the cosine component somehow. So how, do, how is that done? So I mentioned it already. x of n, real and even. If I have this structure, I will have real coefficients at the output of my DFT. Very powerful stuff. What do I mean by real and even? So we know even symmetry, there is some sort of like mirror image of the data. So let's say we take the, our endpoints. So let's say I have x0, x1, x2, x3, right? And let's say each one of these x's so far is real. Real, real, real. Do, 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 do. Let's say we go all the way to x n divided by 2. So let's assume, let's assume that n, uh, let me think. Is it that or minus 1? Probably minus 1. Because then the next guy here, what you want to do, what you want to do is you want to have a mirror image with each other. So each one of these coefficients, each one of these guys, so this is your x of n data. Each one of these guys, uh, each one of these guys should be symmetric, and each one of these guys should be real. When you've got that combination of the two, so let's say x of 0 happens here, and at x of n minus 1, it's also x of 0. Suppose you have x of 1, it should also take place here. If you have x of 2, it should be here. x of 3 should also be here, so on and so forth. So, so essentially, what you've got is, you've got your data has that pattern. This yields a very interesting result mathematically. What this will do, when you do the math, okay? So if we plug this in, so here's actually the expression. This is, so this is another way of doing it. Let, so let's do the mathematical way. So suppose I create S of n. And S of n consists of x of n all the way to n minus 1. And then x of 2n minus n minus 1. So what I'm doing is I'm taking x of n flipping it and concatenating it with x of n. And then I take the DFT. What we do is, if we perform that, and in this case, um, the way the notes are written, it's a little, I, I pulled a little trick. So instead of playing around with n and dividing it by 2 and blah, 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 so instead what I say is, let's suppose I have a sequence x of n that's length n. I'm going to take a 2 point, 2 n point FFT, and applying it to the concatenated version of x of n and its flipped version. So it's called s of n. So let's say we go back to this guy. So let's, let's redraw it nicely. Aye. Come on. I don't know why that resisted. So what I'm doing essentially is I'm taking x of n and then I'm taking his flipped version. Mm. So what would be the best way of describing it? Yeah, like, well, I'm taking x of n, but flipped. OK? And so now what I've got is if each one of these guys is n long and n long, what I've got is 2n long. I take the DFT that's of 2n. And what I've got is, so I have that even symmetry around the axis. And so what I'm going to get at the end of the day is I'm going to get s of k, and it is going to be real, which is a powerful result. And so if I have s of k and it's real,
What does that mean? What happens is if I do the math, how can I get real when I have a complex exponential? I have e to the j something or other, right? The wn part. And so let's say we do a little bit of mathematical manipulation. So first of all, I rewrite s of n in terms of x of n and its counterpart. So that's part one. Then what I do is I play around with x of the second x, the, the second x, not the first x. And I rewrite it in terms of x of n. So I do a change of variables. So I let 2m minus 1 minus m, I rewrite it as n. And everything in that second DFT, this guy here, I rewrite it such that now I have x of n. And I combine these two summations together. Okay? So what I do is this guy here, I change a variable. So now I let m or n. So let's say this guy here, I make him now x of n. And anywhere that had an n, I replace it with the new variable. And what you're going to find out is we're going to get this kind of messy thing over here when we combine it together. And it turns out that this guy here is actually cosine. And we also have this delay term over here. And so this here is what we call, like once we go a little bit through the math, this is called the forward discrete cosine transform. And then likewise, the inverse discrete Fourier transform, we have to look for an S of k that has something called Hermitian symmetry. So what's Hermitian symmetry? So Hermitian sym symmetry is when we have this property here, where if s of n is real, then s of k is essentially represented by, like if you have s 2n minus k, it's going to be equal to its complex conjugate k. And so working through that, we get this expression down here for the inverse um, uh, discrete cosine transform. Okay, actually, I'm, I want to work this out because I, I feel, let's work it out. Just a little bit. So here's S of k. So what's the discrete Fourier transform? So 2n two point, two point. Okay, S of n. Correct? That's right. Now, what we want to do is we want to split this up. Okay. Oh, I forgot. That's 2n. 2n. And then this guy here. And he is going to be. I forgot. Two n minus n minus one. Okay, just want to make sure. Two n minus n minus one. Two n k n. Now, what happens is this is the guy that I'm going to do to change of variables for. Change of variables. So I'm going to let m equal 2m minus n minus 1. So I think this is the part where I think folks might get a little bit confused by. So let's say we take that second part, put it as an aside. So what ends up happening is if I do the change of variables, my x now is x of m. What also happens, let's say we isolate for n. What we end up getting is 2n minus m minus 1. So therefore, my summation index is now 2n minus m minus 1 equals n. And 2n minus m minus 1 is equal to 2n minus 1. Those are the bottom and top 
summation indices for this guy here. And then W, 2, M, N, sorry, K, K stays the same, and then we replace that, too, with this guy here, 2N minus M minus 1. So first of all, let's, let's clean this up and this up. So what is this guy here? Um, if you bring this to the other side, what we end up getting is M equals 0, exactly. And if we clean up this guy here, what do we get? Exactly. You got it, is n minus 1. And so now what we've got is this nice summation, m equals 0 to m minus 1, x of m, and then omega 2n, k, 2n minus m minus 1. And so what we do is we now bring this back. And notice that this has the same structure as this part. We have the same summation range as this guy, and that's why we bring the two together. All right? So when we do that, so that's why it's a little bit confusing the notes. I switched M and N and stuff, so changing indice, uh, indices is always very tricky. So that's where we got now this overall summation of N. So I'm going to let M equals N, you know, just so everyone has the same index. minus 1, x sub n, and then let's say we put brackets, okay? Okay, so now we've got this. And so the trick that you have when you deal with something like this is you say, okay, I have the same 2n, right? That's cool. And I have all this other garbage. So what do I do with it? And the answer is, um, I somehow want to balance this. I, what I see here is I see a cosine. So what I need to do is I need to somehow introduce. So, so if you expand this out, uh, what I see is something here where um, it's Kind of, it's a cosine, but it's unbalanced with its exponent. So I need to add and subtract. I need to multiply this out and divide at the same time, such that this argument here will become a cos. And I'm going to have some sort of phase term here. right? So what I'm going to do is I need to think about it. I need to pull out a part. And that's actually heading back to the notes. That's what I did. So let's go back to the notes, just to clarify. So what I've done is this guy here. So I had all that stuff. I had the first term and I had the second term. What you'll notice is that if you take out w minus k over 2 and, and 2n, this surprisingly gives you these w's and those w's. And the exponents, one's negative and one's positive. Euler's relationship says cosine, right? So it, it takes, an, it takes a, little, like a little bit of getting used to. But just by pulling out that one term, you actually got a cosine, plus this appendage w minus k over 2 divided uh, the, uh, the 2 n business. All right? OK. All right. So in this lecture, what we saw is an overlap save and overlap add method. And I think I went into a lot of detail about it, because you're going to be probably using this a lot, especially if you deal with large data samples and you're very constrained on memory. What I also then talked about is something that some of you might experience, especially if you deal with real data and you want R real data at the output, and you don't want to use complex exponentials, and you just want to use cosine functions, called the discrete cosine transform. So these tools are very useful, and it's all based on the concept of the discrete Fourier transform, which was introduced in the last lecture, in lecture 15. So that um, concludes uh, lecture, lecture 16.
All right. So um, yeah. So in this so.